Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this session on the changes that are proposed to the um, BODS public transport information profile. Um, I'm going. To, I'm Tim Rivett. Um, I'm the DFT lead for uh, Trans Exchange. Um, and um, pick that up from Stuart, who most of you will probably um, remember um, after he moved to um, teaching. Um, I can see exactly why he uh, he abandoned ship, um, having spent the last few months working on this. <laughs> um, but <laughs> so, yeah, um, if we can, I'll, I'll run through it the changes um, and I do want to uh, try and um, answer as many questions as you can um, if we can keep that as much to the end as possible because um, inevitably um, a, a lot of the early questions might well be um, answered um, uh, later on. So um, this is being recorded by the way um, so it can be made available for people that couldn't uh, join us live. <clears throat> so um, we've all had um, the version 1.1 profile um, for um, a long time now. Um, it's always been said that there were likely to need to be a number of changes um, arising from it. Um, standards are created to support people like yourselves in actually um, using it and moving data around. Um, and it's got to be generic enough um, to cope with all sorts of permutations that that exist out in the uh, out in the real world. Um, it can't just be a purely theoretical process, um, but that's where you've got to start out. Um, and then um, you need to uh, to listen to to the feedback, and so that's what we've been doing over the last few months. Um, as Bods has implemented um, version one point one, you've all been trying to to use it, um, and so uh, there's a few uh, little tweaks that we need to make to it um, to uh, to make uh, life easier going forward. Um, if you've read the document and looked at it, the track changes one in particular, there's an awful lot of changes in there. Most of them, though, um, are um, all related to a very small number of things. Um, overall, um, there's eight potential XML changes to systems. Seven of those um, are arise through feedback um, from um, yourselves, some of those technical challenges, some of them are operator compliance challenges, um, things like bank holidays, um, making it easier for the, for the uh, data uh, creators. One XML change um, is, a, uh, is potential breaking change, depending on how you've implemented it, uh, to, uh, to remove security risk. Um, and since 1.1 has been released, there's been uh, a fair few um, drop-in sessions that Ben um, from the DFT KPMG has, has run um, about the validator and how that's working, and there's been a lot of good discussion through that um, as well. So um, hopefully um, we've heard all of the problems and they're all addressed um, in the 1.1a release that you've got a draft of. Um, what you will notice um, in the new version of the document are some um, structural changes. You'll be used to the um, red and um, yellow arrows, arrows to signify either it's a mandatory, you must do this, um, or a, an optional um, advice note type thing. This introduces uh, a bus icon 
uh, which is BOD's implementation specific advice. So things like what's what is the validator looking for? Um, how is um, BOD's working and using that data? Um, as we go through stuff um, this afternoon, um, I've um, put icons next to a number of things. So if there's a profile change, um, you've got the little um, XML um, icon. And if it's because of feedback we've had from people trying to use the profile, uh, it's got the feedback icon on it. A um, couple of things that seem to have um, caused some confusion. So um, data sent to BODS um, goes through two checks. Um, one is a validator and the other is data quality. Validator is a yes, no type thing um, and is checking for the hard compliance things um, uh, I supplying the mandatory fields, for example. Um, data quality is is looking more at the quality and accuracy of things. So more like um, infeasibly short times between stops, that sort of thing. Um, all of the um, validator checks come from the red arrow mandatory things in the profile document. Um, the data quality tests are outlined um, online through the URL. Um, these slides will be circulated afterwards, by the way. Um, so um, first go through a number of general changes and this these form the majority of the changes in the document. So um, there's a number of typos um, that have corrected. Um, there were some bad internal links with references to different sections and things like that. Um, there are still some, um, and depending on what version of Word you're using and whether you're a Mac and things like that, depends on how bad it is. Um, so uh, apologies for that. Um, bookmarking in Word is a nightmare, um, but the uh, the final version will um, use um, hard-coded links, so um, we won't have uh, those problems. Um, it also tidies up some consistency of language, so um, there was references to schema when it should have been profile and, and vice versa. Um, most of the um, changes and uh, relate to um, redefining um, whether some of the elements um, that are available in Trans Exchange are um, not to be used and not sent, um, which is what it used to be. Um, but listening to uh, the way people were using the data and, and um, using systems to supply the data, there was quite a lot of uh, data that was that people were submitting that that was um, in the previous not used, which meant it it, it shouldn't be sent. Um, and um, but actually that was useful data, or it was um, being used in other systems that the source data um, software was was providing, and and the uh, and the hard don't send it. Um, was was causing some problems there and going to cause more work than necessary. So pretty much all of those have now moved to um, optional. So if you've got the data, provide it. Um, BODS is not going to do anything with it. Um, and people consuming data from BODS shouldn't assume that it's going to be there. They can't rely on its availability. Um, because it's not one of the uh, one of the core mandatory fields. Um, hopefully that will mean that um, there's less changes in source data exports and things like that. Um, there are a couple of places where we do say things like not used. Um, and that's we we really don't want people to be sending data um, in those um, elements. Um, that's because um, we're doing, for example, dates in a different way. 
um, and uh, it risks confusing data consumers. Um, but that's not going to result in a validator failure if you do fill it out. Um, but uh, it's just going to confuse downstream users um, if it's included. So those are the general changes. Um, that ripples through the document quite significantly, particularly the the op introduction of optional. Um, but hopefully uh, that makes life quite a lot easier for um, a lot of you. Um, if we go through the specific changes um, and advice that's in there. Um, so um, we've added in some advice on versioning. Um, this was starting to cause um, some um, challenges for people um, and some confusion. So we've included some uh, worked examples in there. Hopefully that makes it clearer uh, for you. Um, and it includes what the validator is looking for. So things like creation date time being there and remaining consistent between different submissions of data um, and revision number um, increasing each time um, data is submitted. And um, if you're sub updating some data in a in a in a for a service and, and not other bits, there's an example of uh, of how you would do that. Um, and so hopefully uh, that clears up how versioning is expected to work in BODS. Um, in notes, um, there's a couple of validator tests that take place. So it checks to see whether there's any dates in there. Um, historically, there's been quite a lot of date data in, in notes fields. Um, you know, so a school service, you might somebody might have actually put the, the dates of operation um, in there all gone. These are the market days. Um, well, we really, really need that encoded properly so downstream data consumers can um, understand it rather than having to trawl through um, text fields and extract dates manually. Um, there's no change there. That's always been there. The bit that has changed with notes is there's a number of disallowed characters. So um, that's to protect against um, injection attacks um, for downstream um, users. Um, BODS is safe, but um, we can't be sure about downstream users and the sanitization that may take place. Um, if as a data, as a system supplier, um, you're not sanitizing the text that goes into that, to check for some of the characters, um, then that might be a breaking change for you. It's the only one, um, but it's needed to uh, to make sure that uh, systems stay secure. Um, validator checks for notes being public and none being marked as private. That's because this data is actually being made public. You know, the whole thing um, is all about open data, so there's no point in having um, private notes in there. Um, serviced organisations, um, one of the uh, areas that there's been quite a lot of debate and um, advice needed to people. Um, it is mandated in the regulations um, that if a vehicle um, is uh, school, college or other establishment linked, then you've got to provide the data. You've got to say what that serviced organisation is and the dates. Um, and so the validator is making sure that the name is um, realistic. Um, so um, SCH, um, for example, is not acceptable because you can't actually work out um what the establishment is from that um and therefore you can't work out whether the dates are correct or not so uh we're needing to see um you know either specific names like college of west 
Anglia or if there's a number of schools that it serves, for example, um, Staffordshire schools, because then you can do a check against the published dates and make sure that the dates that are included in the trans exchange file are valid. Um, one of the um, big challenges um, that I see for operators um, is the the fallout from the from the regulation is that you're not going to be able to submit a registration set of data um, that you might have historically sent to VOSA and gone, we've got a contract for seven years, so bang, um, because you don't know when those schools and education establishments are going to be open in seven years time, you might know for the next 18 months or so. Um, so um, data is going to need to be resubmitted to keep the, the um, service organisations working dates up to date. Um, and so that's a, that's a change for operators um, in business processes and things that, that comes out of this. Um, and the other one is um, you might not know exact dates when you submit um, a registration, um, but before the service goes live, um, any provisional dates uh, needs to be removed and, and final dates submitted. Um, if you try and um, submit a trans exchange file that's got provisional dates that start in the past, um, you're going to get a, uh, a failure because um, you should know exact dates and you shouldn't be using provisional um, for, uh, for, for now and in the past. Um, operator um, knock codes um, have um, caused some um, challenges. Most of those I think we've overcome um, in the sense that operators have worked out what they are. Um, you should use the knock code um, that was used to register the service. So not top group or something like that, but it needs to link up with the registration um, operator um, and the validator, um, in addition to checking that it's a valid knock, um, looks to make sure there's any one operator data in there and not using uh, licensed operator, which is what you would use if you were doing a um, EBSR submission, for example. Um, services, um, one of the big um, areas that's that's caused some um, challenges for people um, is that BODS is, is registration data based rather than line or route based. So if you're used to submitting data to travel line, for example, um, they're interested in it on a line or route base. Um, BODS wants it as per registration, so um, lines and routes might need to be split between files if it's a split registration, for example. Um, that does mean consumers need to um, piece some data together sometimes, um, but it's needed for uh, from compliance checking. Um, to make sure that uh, all of the data that's being expected to be submitted is being submitted. Um, the service code um, that's submitted um, is something that we've seen changing over time. Um, when people have updated data, it needs to maintain its consistency um, because otherwise version management starts to go out of the window and downstream data users don't know whether that's a new um, service that's, that's starting up um, or not. Um, so uh, it needs to um, keep consistent. Um, operating dates. Um, this was a, a challenging one. Um, so um, previously um, you weren't, you had to provide an end date for a service if you knew the end date um, 
arbitrary end dates like 2099 um, that some systems have used historically um, not acceptable. It's got to be an actual known end date um, and the original profile um, had some stuff in there that um, um, at the time um, would have seemed sensible um, with a don't supply an end date if it's more than uh, one year away. Um, but um, that was causing some problems, particularly with contracted services where there was a known end date that was a few years away. So um, that one year restriction has been removed. Um, the validator um, does do a check that looks for um, end dates that are no more than 11 years after the start date. Um, the rationale behind that is the longest known um, contract um, is for 10 years. And so uh, that allows for early submission and uh, and tidying up afterwards and things like that. Um, so uh, the validator does check that um, you're not providing um, end dates that are a silly time away. Um, journey pattern. Um, you do need to provide at least one journey pattern for a standard service. Um, there's a few people that have been submitting without. Um, and um, we've seen a few people submitting interchange activity um, that are not just change and through, um, which are the only things that are uh, that are allowed in in BODs. Um, lines, um, one of the um, optional, one of the fields that previously was a was a don't submit. Um, that is now optional that we've got a lot of um, requests for is line colour. Um, so where an operator has a preferred line colour for use on um, timetables and maps and things like that, um, we're actually ref not just referencing it as uh, as optional, it's included there as a, well, if you got it, then uh, actually that's really helpful. Um, the um, one that I thought we were going to have some significant problems with, but we we don't seem to have had too many, um, is the um, a service. So the the data in the file needs to consist of one or more related lines. There's got to be some form of um, relationship between the lines. Um, so um, the validator is looking to make sure there's at least two stop points in common um, between the lines in a in a service file. Um, and it also checks that um, descriptions are being provided. Um, we've seen a number of uh, cases where um, the, the, the outbound or the inbound uh, description is provided and it's the wrong way around. Um, if you've only got a one-way service, um, you can call that an inbound or an outbound, depending on on the direction of other services in the area um, to match, and you need to provide the right description. Um, stop points um, for operators um, and authorities. Um, we can see that there's going to be a bedding in period for this um, and some um, challenges. Um, so stop point is allowed for a maximum period of two months. Um, that should be enough time to agree um, whether a new stop is going to be there or alternative arrangements and update the data to reflect what's actually happening. Um, um, two months is longer than any known event where there's a temporary stop that, that we've identified. So, um, you know, county shows and things like that. Um, sometimes temporary stops exist for, for three weeks, but, but never two months. Um, and where there's a really long term diversion, um, that should be being planned and a temporary stop put in NAPTAN. Um, because that then enables uh, downstream systems to understand journey planners to 
to, to start to work properly and, and that sort of thing. Um, routes and tracks, there's a number of things that the validator is checking for to make sure that um, route sections are reusable as much as possible. Um, I think most of those problems um, have now been overcome by people. Um, journey pattern. Um, the wording um, and the interpretation was um, challenging. So if you've got a um, a service that only goes one way, some people because of the wording were were trying to supply um, more than one journey pattern. Um, whereas actually you can only supply realistically a journey pattern um, for each direction that the service operates. So if it's only one way, um, or it's a circular, for example, um, you know, you've got to provide at least one. Um, you may not have two if you don't have any, um, you know, different individual journeys and things like that. Um, and the validators doing a number of tests, um, looking at um, the way the data is being provided to make sure that it matches um, the requirements that are uh, that are outlined. Um, things like destinations and overriding um, some of the operating um, data. Um, activity, um, so the original version um, expected each individual stop to have um, the activity that a vehicle was doing at it explicitly documented. So for every stop, you would have to um, say whether it was pick up or set down. Um, there is a default in Trans Exchange. Um, the fact that it was needed to be um, set out explicitly was causing some very large files, much larger than they needed to be. Uh, makes it harder to, uh, to debug other problems. Um, and so um, changes that the default um, in trans exchanges uh, pick up and set down, which is going to be right for at least 95% of stops. Um, so that's going to be acceptable. Um, hopefully that will make um, things easier. There was quite a few um, data suppliers that were um, failing tests because of this. Um, now, if you've got software that is providing um, every stop explicitly, you're not going to get penalised for that. It's not going to cause a failure or anything like that. So there's no need to change software um, if you've made the change to uh, to list them all explicitly. Um, there is currently a data quality test that looks at whether the first stop is um, designated as set down and the last stop is designated as pick up only. Um, that's wrong. You know, at the first stop, you've got nobody on board to set down. Um, and likewise, at the last stop, I don't know where people will be going if you're picking them up. Um, so uh, so the check for that, um, that might well be being moved into a validator um, at uh, some point in future. Um, vehicle journey, um, validator is checking for um, um, things like um, where there's overriding data. So um, if you've got um, the data that's been done at, um, uh, at a profile level, um, then um, you shouldn't be providing it in more than, the data in more than one way. If you're going to basically, if you're going to override something, you need to be um, overriding the lot rather than little bits of it. Um, and um, checking that um, link back to one of the previous um, checks that actually there is a destination um, being provided. Um, operating profile, um, again, um, some validator checks, um, checking that there's no grouping enumerations. So um, 
not saying Monday to Friday, for example, um, being explicit on the on the days of the week that are being um, operated um, and um, departure day shift. So this is where a service runs over midnight. Um, you can only do that once. Um, and um, within the operating profile, that's where you um, talk about the days that you're operating, um, bank holidays, um, always a sticky subject. We'd all like more bank holidays, but um, that's a by the by. Um, there's a few things that have been um, causing some challenges and therefore um, changes. So um, strictly Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve, um, which normally for operators are runoff days, they're not strictly bank holidays. Um, the Trans Exchange Schema thinks they are, though, and so therefore um, they need to be coded as such um, in data being sent to BODs. Um, and um, originally um, it was mandated that every bank holiday needed to be um, either um, defined as um, a day of operation or a day of non-operation um, because the list of bank holidays in Trans Exchange includes um, the Scottish ones um, that was causing some um, challenges and for the sake of the um, six or seven um, services that go cross-border um, that was um, going to cause some um, significant problems for the other thousands where it went nowhere near Scotland um, and therefore operators didn't, you know, wh when is St Andrew's Day? Um, unless you're in Scotland, you probably don't know. Um, so um, it's no longer mandatory to provide the Scottish um, um, bank holidays. Um, you have to provide all the others either as a as a working day or a non-working day. Um, and the validator is going to check for that. Um, but you don't have to provide the Scottish ones. Um, but if you do provide all of them, um, then um, that's great, particularly if you're um, operating service into Scotland. Um, that's going to be uh, very valuable for the customer. Um, but um, you know it's not going to be a penalised job um, because uh, that's that's useful data. It's not mandatory though to provide the Scottish ones. Um, there is another challenge here for operators um, because some of the days like Boxing Day and New Year's Day, for example, um, move days and the way that Trans Exchange defines when a day works and uh, when um, when a, a journey is going to run or not, um, there is going to need to be um, an update um, to, to data in BODs um, at least annually to, to make sure that um, downstream systems interpret the data correctly um, and make sure that, uh, that, that journeys are being shown as running on the days that they're supposed to be. Um, so again, on that note, with these files, do you want them to end date when they know that they're going to need to update, say, the following year due to bank holidays, or do you want them to not end date and then just provide an update? Um, it's going to be best to provide an update for what's happening between Christmas and New Year when people know. So typically, you know, that will be being decided September, October sort of time. Um, because um, otherwise, um, it's just going to get more complicated for people. OK, so the original file that someone submits, if they know they, they're going to need to come back to it. Yeah, yeah. Just don't put an end date on and then just do what you normally would do. Change it further down the line. Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If somebody's really brave and wants to, you know, um, work out what they're doing many years in the future, then uh, then fine. But at some point, that's going to run out um, mm -hmm. on an open-ended um, service. 
Um, so they're going to have to come back to it at some point. OK, um, and then um, the last um, thing is real time information. Um, block is required um, and it needs to match what's being provided in Siri VM. Um, there is some discussion going on at the moment about um, the timing of mandation for block. Um, but uh, but it is mandatory um, and uh, and so that's going to need to match. And there's a number of other fields that um, where um, Siri VM feeds are being provided, the location data, um, the, the data that's in, in that feed needs to match what's in the trans exchange. Um, and, and that's really key to providing good quality information to customers reliably. Um, and um, because it's recognised that the block um, is an operational bit of data, uh, you might not know that when you register a service. Um, you might only um, plan vehicle allocation and things like that, you know, two weeks, a week in advance. Um, the, the, uh, the, the validate uh, the data quality test um, sorry, make sure that um, um, that it's not empty if there's less than a week to go for the service to be operational. So that's a run through of the changes. Most of those are um, advice and guidance on what's going on with the validator rather than um, actual changes. Um, to the profile, as I said at the start, there's only um, eight changes, um, so not very many, um, and only one of those is breaking. Um, in terms of time scales, um, the current plan um, is that we've asked you for um, comments and feedback. This is part of that process this session. Um, we need comments um, by the 24th of June, please. Um, and that will then uh, enable us all being well um, to get the final 1.1a version of the document published on the 2nd of July. Um, to, so people uh, have some certainty about um, when the new one's out. OK, um, so. Um, Let's um, open the floor to um, questions. I'm sure that I will have not answered every question anybody's got. So, um, uh. I may have just put his hand up, Tim. Yeah, OK. Um, I'm just trying to get the screen back up. Yeah. OK, um, Amir. Hey Tim, nice to meet you. Uh, Amir from Optibus. Um, so I wanted to check, perhaps I missed uh, the first 30 seconds of the call. Um, this version is version 1.1a. It is different. Um, do you have uh, do you have a summary of, or perhaps my question is, are there any new mandatory requirements uh, that are different between version 1.1 published in August and version 1.1a? That we're talking about right now. Um, the um, the that there is one potential breaking change. Um, all the rest, um, you should be okay if you've been following. Um, the breaking change um, is um, the um, disallowing of some characters in the notes fields, um, and that's to stop. Um, injection attacks downstream. So you might well be validating um, uh, and sanitizing data when it's put into your system. Um, not everybody uh, might be. And so we need to make sure that um, downstream um, the data consumers um, don't come across problems as a result of it. Um, so, um, so there's a list of uh, disallowed characters. Um, that's the own. That's that's the only potential breaking change in there. 
Thank you. Um, and my follow-up question, uh, where and when would this slide deck and the new version would be available? So um, this slide deck I will send out to people that have registered for this event. Um, that will be available to um, Tess today. Um, you've got the list, haven't you, Tess? Yeah, I will send it out as soon as you send it to me. Yeah, cool. Um, and um, as I said in the in the last slide, comments back by the 24th. Um, and we hope to get it published um, on the 2nd of July. Thank you very much. Any other question? Ian? Yeah, just got two little questions. Uh, firstly, knock cords. Do you pick up the knock cord information from the travel line that manage not codes is that where you're getting the match from yes yes that is the only well, source of knock well if we're looking at what we're comparing against we're comparing against the not codes allocated in your organizational profile on bod which should yep. be from the travel line as the ultimate reference understood thank you second question regarding the first bus stop of, of a trip and the last bus stop of the trip. Did you say that we now have to mark the first as pick up only, or did you say that set down and pick up is okay because it's impossible to pick up? Sorry, set down. Uh, um, at the moment, it's a data quality check, um, but in future, it might become a, uh, a validator, so mandatory that it's set differently. Um, it does affect some journey planners' um, ability to uh, to plan journeys. So you're looking for us to put on the very first stop. It should be only pick up. Yeah. And the very last stop set down. Yeah. Okay. Those are the only questions I have. Excellent. Just. If we can continue that question on the first stop and last stop, um, if you've got a circular route, would that make sense? Because you could keep, you know, someone could get on halfway and go the kind of second half of the loop, if that makes sense. Um, yes, it does, because each route link um, has a uh, start stop and, a, and an end stop. And so mm -hmm. uh, they, they, they would match. Um, and so you would arrive um, and uh, and you would depart from the same stop. Um, and mm -hmm. so uh, the two would match up and it, it's OK. OK. OK, any more questions? Rob. Hi, Tim. Just picking up on something you said there about the um, block information. Um, my understanding was that it was um, recommended, it was strongly recommended, if you like, but you used the words mandatory just now. Is that a change that all trips must have a block reference associated with them? And if that is the case, how does that impact the um, the Excel tool? Um, so um, it's mandatory in the Siri feed, but it's not mandatory in the uh, in the trans exchange profile. OK, so effectively, it does mean that it becomes mandatory in, in trans exchange because the two need to do need to match up. Um, but at, when data is submitted to BODS for a registrate, you know, a, a, when it's first submitted, when somebody's designed a service and things like that, you won't have that. Um, so it needs to be able to be submitted um, without that data, without block. Right. OK. And um, perhaps some extra words need to go into the document to clarify exactly how that process works. Yes. Um, the, perhaps an impact of that also is that if the timetable doesn't change in terms of passenger timings, um, 
you might still need to resubmit the service because you might re-block it, if, if, if that's a suitable word, if you reschedule the, the vehicles but don't change the times, um, you're still going to need to resubmit to BODS. That's, yes, that would, that's right. Okay. Yes. Yes. Thank you. And um, one one last thing, if nobody else is jumping in and putting their hand up, um, just um, thank you for the clarification on um, the split registrations um, business. Um, that obviously is, is a bit of a change from where we started a couple of years back. Um, but it's good to have that cleared up now that that we're looking at registration based data, not at passenger facing data. Um, and we need to get that right. Is is there an enforcement date for that particular um, issue? Um, it's a so um, when when um, the hard block gets put in is a is a project based decision um which um i think that discussion is still going on um about when that hard block um for compliance with this profile um is going to be um i don't know whether um Eva or tess uh, are able to say anything about that yes hi hi it's Eva. uh so uh, at present, uh, we put um, the aspirational date of the 2nd of August. Uh, this is to support the operators to solve the PTI profile issues ahead of a high um, velocity of submission of data ahead of the school, uh, school timing. At the end of the day, um, the hard block is an artificial, um, uh, <laughs> is the real, but at the same time, it's an artificial situation because there is nothing stopping uh, the industry to make this change and compliance with the PTI profile at this point. We do have quite a few of, uh, of um, publishers published the data and we have two instances uh, where the files are fully compliant uh, to date and we know that the industry is working towards to make um, the files compliant towards the 2nd of August. There might be situations, we are certainly aware of one, uh, which might be problematic and therefore we keep this um, date as an aspirational date. Uh, it's not our intention to stop, uh, not to publish uh, timetables data because uh, the data has been consumed uh, and by, by, uh, by developers and uh, it will, um, is, is being working towards um, being um, uh, supportive towards passengers. But I hope that everyone on this call would understand the dependency of uh, timetables, AVL, maybe not so much, but first in particular later on. If we assume uh, that the industry needs to be um, compliant fully with the regulations by the end of the year, uh, with the grace period of this year, so the regulation was at the beginning of, of January um, and then there is a grace period right now where we work with the industry, TVSA and OTC is approaching um, different operators and supporting everyone, clarifications are happening, who is in scope or not, what, which school services are in scope, which are not, etc. So if we do not address the PTI validations as quickly as possible, uh, we suspect there would be a lot of issues for the industry at the end of the year ahead of Christmas time when the regulation needs to be met. So therefore, we really, um, I, I think we have spoken to all technology suppliers about that and everybody's working towards that. We definitely spoke to 
all big five and and major um, operators and uh, we test in particular is having calls with uh, small operators which we have quite a few on a daily basis uh, right now to to really uh, try to encourage everyone to work work towards um, the PTI compliance operators are effectively those who are using the suppliers and uh, you know trans exchange tool is also a sort of supplying body so dft is the supplier for trans exchange tool operators um, are really in charge of free fields corrections of free fields the knock code the license number and the service number service code from the OTC database, the so license number and the service code and no code from timetables. Every other violations, PTI violation needs to be addressed by the supplier. So whether this is us, whether this is Europe with Elidium or Opti, Omni, or sometimes there, there's a combination of Reviewing supplier and publishing suppliers a combination of Omni and Ticketer, for example. Okay. So this is where the operators need to talk to their suppliers when there is a violation of the PTI. At the moment, uh, the, the files can be published and uh, each of the publisher would get the report on how many times the file has been violated and which line has been violated and which elements have been violated. Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, Paul. Um, I'd just like to pick up on Rob's point. How do you enter block ref if you're using the XLS tool? Um, they, there's a, an update to um, the spreadsheet tool um, that's coming, isn't there? Um, which is going to um, uh, make that option available. Tess, would you like to answer this query? Thanks. Sorry, I, my internet just dropped out. Could you could you repeat yourself, Paul? So oh, my block, question is: block sorry, the trans exchange spreadsheet tool. Yeah. So at the moment, it's not supported by the tool, but the DFT is committed to kind of taking the tool through a new evolution or investing in a browser-based tool um there are there is already a one tool being developed and we'll be reviewing that kind of later in the year it will be part of the next generation whatever happens um but it's not possible at this very moment no okay i i would just like to make the point that asking operators to continually use different tools and to re-enter their data is not something that is seen as awfully helpful. So we, you know, be very nice to have a definitive way of getting operator data into the system once and for all. If, you know, if there's a browser-based thing, then can we just hang on and do that? Use that? No, it does need to be provided as soon as possible using the tools available, please. But you know, you're asking us for you're asking us for something which um, was mentioned to be mandatory that's not supported by the tool. No, it's not. Okay, test. Go on, please test. Yeah. So I think Tim clearly said earlier it's mandatory in the theory of the end, and it should be there in the trans exchange wherever possible. Obviously, right now it's not possible with the DFT tool, but it will be in the next generation. Okay, I've, I've, I, I just find it difficult to to understand the rationale between what's mandatory and what's what's optional and what's advisory and and what's changing. I, I mean, you know, there's there's things changing left, right, and centre. It's very very difficult for us to keep up, let alone the operators. Paul, I think we can probably work with Tim to get a code snippet that you could use to include that in your data. Tim, would that be possible for us to look into? Uh that's something that we can look at, yes. Um, but Paul, that's why um, the the way that the the trans exchange profile is is created and and the fields 
Um, you know, bl block growth is not mandatory for that, but it's mandatory in in uh, Siri, um, and and that's one of the reasons why that's the case. Um, you know, at some point in future, you can see how it becomes mandatory in both to make sure that you can match the date real time data more effectively. Um, but that's why one of the reasons why it's not mandatory at the moment. Are you able to give us some timescales of when the browser based tool will be available? No, I can't give you this time scale. This this is a completely dif different project uh, for now. Um, I don't think it will start earlier than in late autumn or likely early winter. Uh, for the time being, the plan is to use the trans exchange tool in Excel spreadsheets. We made as much investment as is possible. There are a lot of different dependencies on the project and uh, uh, it is. It has been. It is just not possible to prioritize that to make it available in mass. Uh, we 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 need to concentrate on adding functionalities, uh, which are far more uh, important right now, and enhance the current provision and curate the the data set as it is. The data quality in bots um, is um, is not of. Um, the required standard, and we really um, would like to concentrate on analyzing it, monitoring, profiling, and working with the industry to enhance the data quality. Uh, this is this is the the absolute focus of the team, and um, and we really need to concentrate on expanding on the first uh, functionality for a variety of different first structures, which are very complex in the whole industry. And therefore, um, the, the online tool, which would be ideal, um, uh, is the prioritized and it will need to be delivered later on. Um, I'm sorry to disappoint you, Paul, but uh, I, I cannot help with this. OK, um, thank you. Uh... Is there any more questions? No. OK. Uh, One quick question. Yes, Ian, Ian yes. Um, it was based on something that was just said, service code. Yes. The service code that we supply to the OTC is not the same as the service code we supply to bots. And you made reference that they are identical. Can you just clarify, do you actually check that the service code in a registration and the service code in a BODS file is the same? Uh, we will check it <laughs> from July uh, or August time. Uh, this is for sure because we are writing API to the OTC database. But um, Tim, I just wonder whether you can display the slide with the format of the service yeah, code. That's what I'm just uh, trying to uh, get to. And obviously the second part of that question is, have you confirmed with the OTC that this is an acceptable way of defining service code? Yes. I mean, the difference over here, um, because this is an XML file, so we uh, do have the colon uh, between um, the alphanumeric uh, field PF and seven digits, and then colon, and then uh, two, sometimes three uh, digits. Uh, whereas in the OTC database, this is uh, being uh, divided by um, forward slash, um, but XML uh, does not accept forward uh, slashes uh, for that reason. It needs to be replaced by colon. Uh, but this is the, the service number. It is called in the database, OTC is called a registration number. And um, but this is how we uh, understand that this is the service code. So on this service, you can run, run up to six different lines, um, I'm being told. Uh, so it is important that definition of the service is the same as definition in the OTC database. So yes. 
I okay. might. I mean, we run out of time. Um, mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I don't have at the front of me the, the OTC file, uh, but we have checked that. I just wanted to say that from um, later summer time, we will be uh, checking the compliance against the OTC registration. Uh, we are writing API uh, to it uh, right now, and it would be checked in near real time. So when um, the publishers would be publishing the data, we will be checking uh, whether the data is complete and accurate. Yeah, thank you. Okay, Tim. I'm um, just a quick question about that API. Are you going to make that public? Because at the moment, it's very difficult to get that information from any other source. You can't download the database, and the um, public API that's there doesn't allow you to really query it in a useful way. I will make this question. Um, it's not my team who is doing it. So we joined two forces with the BSOC team. Uh, to request this API. However, uh, we had to write a memorandum of understanding for data sharing between OTC and DFT. I'm not aware, I don't think that um, it would allow for making it open, but nevertheless, I will, I will definitely ask this question to him. So let me take this, whether this would be possible. Uh, at the moment, we are going to read. We are going to read the data which is publicly available uh, to the industry. So, um, at the moment, OTC is publishing five files on Sunday, each Sunday in the batch process, uh, which um, we initially were planning to use, uh, but. Uh, we managed to to organize the forces to to build the API together. Um, we will come back to you, Tim. Okay. And you. When I when I send out the slides to everyone later, I'll also send a link to where you can download okay. that data. Yeah. Thanks. Um, just so that everyone knows, it is dated for many years ago. It's, they do update it once a week. I think every Sunday or Monday. Apologies, I don't know the exact date, but um, once a week. But the date never changes. Yeah, but the hard code, the message is just saying that it's from 2014. It, it is not. It, it is the regular update, which might have put some people off. But yeah. We have checked that it's definitely weekly batch update. Yes. OK, thanks. OK, um, thank you, everybody. Um, we've come to the end of um, the time for this. Um, if you've got... Um, any more questions and comments, um, then if you let me and Tess know, um, we will uh, do our best to uh, to answer them um, and, uh, and and address them in the profile if appropriate. Um, and uh, as I say, hopefully um, all being well, um, beginning of July, um, version 1.1a will be formally published. OK, thank you, everybody, for your time this afternoon. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. Thank you. Goodbye. Thanks. Thank you. The second part of that question is, have you confirmed with your OTC that this is an acceptable way of defining service code? Yes. I mean, the difference over here, um, because this is an XML file, so we uh, do have the colon uh, between um, the alphanumeric uh, field PF and seven digits, and then colon, and then uh, two, sometimes three uh, digits. Uh, whereas in the OTC database, this is uh, being uh, divided by um, forward slash. Um, but XML uh, does not accept forward uh, slashes, so for that reason, it needs to be replaced by colon. Uh, but this is the, the service number. It is called in the database, OTC is called a registration number. And um, But this is how we uh, understand that this is the service code. 
So on the servers, you can wrap, run up to six different lines, um, I'm being told. Uh, so it is important that definition of the service is the same as definition in the OTC database. So, yes. I okay. might. I mean, we run out of time. Um, unfortunately, I don't have at the front of me the, the OTC file, uh, but we have checked that. I just wanted to say that from um, later summer time, we will be uh, checking the compliance against the OTC registration. Uh, we are writing API uh, to it uh, right now, and it would be checked in near real time. So when um, the publishers would be publishing the data, we will be checking uh, whether the data is complete and accurate. Yeah, thank you. Okay, Tim. I'm just a quick question about that API. Are you going to make that public? Because at the moment, it's very difficult to get that information from any other source. You can't download the database and the um, public API that's there doesn't allow you to really query it in a useful way. I will make this question. Um, it's not my team who is doing it. So we joined two forces with the BSOC team uh, to request this API. However, uh, we had to write a memorandum of understanding for data sharing between OTC and DFT. I'm not aware. I don't think that um, it would allow for making it open. But nevertheless, I will. I will definitely ask this question to me. So let me take this. Whether this would be possible? Uh, at the moment, we are going to read. We are going to read the data which is publicly available uh, to the industry. So. Um, at the moment, OTC is publishing five files on Sunday, each Sunday in the batch process, uh, which um, we initially were planning to use, uh, but uh, we managed to, to organize the forces to, to build the API together. Um, we will come back to you, Tim. Okay. And when I when I send out the slides to everyone later, I'll also send a link to where you can okay. download okay. that data. Yeah. Thanks. Um, just so that everyone knows, it is dated from many years ago. It's, they do update it once a week, I think, every Sunday or Monday. Apologies, I don't know the exact date, but um, once a week. But the date never changes. Yeah, but the hard code, the message is just saying that it's from 2014. It, it is not. It, it is the regular update, which might have put some people off. But yeah. We have checked that it's definitely weekly batch update. Okay, yes. thanks. Okay, um, thank you, everybody. Um, we've come to the end of um, the time for this. Um, if you've got um, any more questions and comments, um, then if you let me and Tess know, um, we will uh, do our best to uh, to answer them um, and, uh, and and address them in the profile if appropriate. Um, and uh, as I say, hopefully um, all being well, um, beginning of July, um, version 1.1a will be formally published. Okay. Thank you, everybody, for your time this afternoon.